So here we are, we're in Bovington Tank Museum and it's quite echoey, we're here before the public, so we're very lucky. Behind me, you will see a variant of a vehicle that again is very, very close to my heart. I spent a lot of time in my military career operating on them, however this is one of the really early ones. This is the Scorpion Combat Vehicle Reconnaissance Tract. It's made of aluminium, it's got a 76mm gun, it is not a tank. Before anyone ever tells you, it's not a tank. And to tell you more about it, we're about to talk to David Wiley, the curator here at Bovington. Okay, so here we are, socially distanced, and curator of Bovington Tank Museum. David, good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome, and welcome all of you. Some of you I know who will be watching this know the Tank Museum, or you may have been here. Some of you may have been watching some of the other content, a bit like this, that we put out on our YouTube channel as well. But I'm going to talk to you now about this vehicle that started life before you were even born, actually, this particular one. Um, back in the 60s, there was a requirement for the British Army. We had an idea at the time we wanted track reconnaissance and also wheeled reconnaissance vehicles. And what ended up happening is we came up with a series of vehicles called CVRT, Combat Vehicle Reconnaissance Tract, and also CVRW, which ended up becoming the Fox. Yeah, that was a wheeled variant of a reconnaissance vehicle. So this fella here was put together by Alvis, and the one we're looking at, you can tell, it's not a production one because SP is basically means special project. So this is one of the prototype Scorpions, um, which is often called the, the, the daddy, the parent vehicle of this family. And they have seven different variants built around the same, quite often using the same engine, the same track, the same transmission, uh, with different, as it were, hulls on top, doing different roles. But that vehicle becomes, you know, for blokes of my age, this was your action man tank. This was the vehicle that you saw on the news a fair bit. Um, there it was at one point patrolling Heathrow Airport, etc. And it starts off back in the 1960s with the idea that we needed a reconnaissance vehicle, but we wanted it light and air portable. So that they design it with the idea you can get two of these that can fit in a C-130 Hercules and fly it wherever you want around the world. They make it of aluminium armour, so you're getting a vehicle that in terms of weight, they're keeping that weight right down to the barest minimum, and it gives it a 76 millimeter, what they call a medium velocity gun. It's a gun that's put together with the idea that it'll fire a range of ammunition types. You can fire something called HESH, high explosive squash head, that could potentially take on another tank. You just got to remember, 76 millimeters, about the size of a Sherman tank gun in World War II, but it doesn't have that same amount of force behind the round. So Hesh is used, it pancakes on the side of a vehicle before exploding a fraction after it's pancaked and putting a shockwave through to cause the scab come off on the inside. You don't want to be taking on other tanks as you're driving around in this, but if you have to, you've got some form of protection there as well. Smoke discharges, you can see on the side, driver in the front there, two crew members in the top, you've got a gunner and the commander that in that smallish turret there. Again, all aluminium, but when they're designing this, they have this big issue they've got to come up with. We've built this vehicle for the first time in Britain, we're looking at, uh, well not necessarily the first time, but most bigger tanks tend to have the engine in the back. Here, they've got the position, the driver sat here, and they want to put the engine down the side next to him. So it's a long, narrow space is where the engine's gonna go. And as Elvis are designing this, they're looking around for a suitable type of engine. This is still a period where the British Army is using petrol engines. So what do they do? They go and find this wonderful piece of kit designed back, it starts its design back in the war years, William Haynes of Jaguar, this is the uh, Jaguar L60 engine, the 4.2, um, and what they basically do, it's the, what you've got there is the E-type sports car engine. They derate it, they just give it one carburetor, little few fiddles around the edges, but at last we've got about 190 horsepower, something you can squeeze in the side in that long elongated shape. And that gives this very light vehicle the sort of speed and oomph that they really want and a production Scorpion still holds the Guinness World Record for 
being the fastest production tank. They did about 51 miles an hour at a test track up at Chertsey. Um, so this gave you speed. And for reconnaissance, yes, they like the idea of having a bit of punch. There's two ways you do reconnaissance. Sometimes kick the ante, you know, fire a few rounds, let's see what comes out. Other ways they sometimes do it is stealth and speed. And this was giving you a speed that you really up there almost with a wheel vehicle. So that was fantastic. Um, it's sea service with the British Army. You served in it. You know, it goes a number of places. It's in the uh, first Gulf War. It goes out to the Falklands fairly soon after it's gone into service. It goes into service, by the way, in about 72. They start seeing service um, and they come out of service in 94. And why they like them as well is this design, because of the light weight they're managing to get here, the track pressure, the ground pressure beneath that track is less pressure there than the ground pressure beneath your foot. And that's how clever tracks can be in spreading out the weight. So in the Falklands, famously, one of these drove over a frozen bog, ended up sitting there, the commander jumped off the side and he fell straight through the ice because the track was keeping that vehicle's pressure spread out over the ice, his foot was heavier, and off he goes through the ice that way. So, you know, a very, very sophisticated vehicle. As I said, seven other different variants built on the chassis, and uh, it carries on in service, amazingly enough. We got rid of the actual Scorpion with a 76 millimeter gun, but we've still got Scimitar in service. We've still got a number of the variants around the edges soldiering on to this day. And that's not bad going when you think of a vehicle that first goes into production back in the 70s. It was 50 years old, you know. So David, why? did we need this vehicle? What was it designed, where was it initially designed to go? What was it designed to replace, if anything? Yeah, so in Britain, we like wheeled armor in World War II, but we also use tracks. And again, this argument, why, why the difference between the two? Wheels tend to be quieter. Tracks can get you places that traditionally wheels can't go to. And that's why we had a debate. And sometimes we wanted one type, sometimes the other. Sometimes in service, we had both types at the same time, track reconnaissance and wheeled reconnaissance. And the other thing, this is dating back to an era, you're still looking at end of empire. One of the original specifications for this vehicle was so it was only of a certain width, so it could get down the rubber plantations in Malaya. So, you know, those are the sorts of things. Nowadays, we'd be thinking, well, good grief, that wouldn't be the sort. But again, you know, there'd be other considerations today because of bridge weights, all sorts of things, you know, urban congestion. You know, there's no point in having something so massive it can't drive somewhere. Um, and the idea was that when it came out, again, Alvis very cleverly, for the military, for a private car owner, we don't always look at it in terms of commonality of parts and everything else that way. That's not our issue. Whereas for the military, if you're taught to drive with the same set of controls, fairly similar specifications for the vehicle. All of that is really helpful if it means you can move into different models in a family rather than you're specifically trained on one type of vehicle and you can't take that skill set to another type. So with Elvis coming up with a armored personnel carrier, an ambulance variant, a recovery variant, lots of different things all based with that same round, that same engine design, you know, transmission, etc. That was really very useful. And it also ends up being a huge sales success. So about 3,000 of these are built. They're in use with the British Army, just over about 300 of them. But the rest of them are sold around the world and lots of countries are still using them. David, Alvis, what came first, the car or the armoured vehicle? Alvis goes back, obviously, the car. So again, it's back to this crossover to the pedigree of where you've got motor industry. Um, it, normally, it's things like wartime. Um, it's an interesting history. We can look at that in one of the other vehicles in the museum. But this idea that come war, we are obviously looking to who are the types of manufacturers we can push over into helping us build military kit. And, you know, and also, quite simply, with a number of manufacturers, your usual market disappears in wartime. People aren't buying cars in the middle of the, the Second World War. So that idea of then swapping over to where your use and uh, your abilities are and also you know who's got what skill sets now in america in particularly in world war ii they went to the car industry for building um, tanks in britain we tended to go to heavier industries to be honest early on um, and that tended to be people like the railway uh, manufacturers things like that carriage manufacturers um, for building heavier stuff by for like tanks but of course Armoured cars, etc., etc., like Daimler, we go to. A number of other companies will make lighter vehicles with their 
some of their current tooling, but obviously they, you know, it's a big issue. How do you build something like this? It's a very specific skill set to put together an armoured vehicle. David, there's something on here that I just noticed that I find the very concept of terrifying, and it's this long piece of, of, of metal along the, the sponsor. Is it still called the sponsor plate? Well, you get, I'd call this one the chassis, but yeah, sponsor's <laughs> bits on the side with the guns in. What is this? So in the 70s, there was a spate uh, or an idea in, Brit in the British Army that everything was going to have to be amphibious one way or another. So if you go back to World War II, where an engineer, Nicholas Strausler, ends up creating the floating, first of all he does it on a little light Tetrarch tank, then a Valentine tank, and then we know for the D-Day landings we put the, a screen, a canvas screen, on a Sherman tank propeller at the back, and the idea is it will propel you through the water because it displaces enough water, it will float. And in the 70s they look at ways of making most British Army vehicles, whether it's a Saladin armoured car, this is the uh, Scorpion light vehicle, reconnaissance vehicle. The screen comes up, so it's under there, it's plastic, it's all concertina down. That comes all the way up, and there's a sort of plastic vision port in it. And the idea is you displace enough water so this vehicle will float, and the traps going round scoop up enough water to propel it forward at about three miles an hour on dead flat water. Now, you can imagine, you know, going on any sort of, you wouldn't go on the sea with this, it might just get you across a short um, European river. The issue there was we were going to blow up all the bridges as the Red Army had come the other way in the Cold War. We'd have blown up all those bridges, the Rhine, the Nader Rhine, the Wow, um, all of that. But if we'd had to attack back the other way, how were we going to go back? And our bridging assets were never enough. And certainly for Recce, you need to think, what, how do I find out what's the other side of that river course? Because you're radioing back all the time that information, you need to get across that river or that uh, bit of water. So that's why they were doing this. Now, I don't think they ever used it other than training, and, uh, and, and basically I've never seen that idea of doing these things operationally, because when you're still sitting on the, that number of tonnage, you know, if anything rips, um, if you get flooded over the top, boof, you're going down straight away. Gearbox. Talk to me about the gearbox on this vehicle because it's not a... It, it's somewhere between a motorcycle and a car gearbox, isn't it? I wish I could talk to you about the gearbox on this. I'm not a gearbox fanatic. <laughs> I have to say, this is you coming on to So, So I will talk you, about this you then. You talk about it. That gives so, you an excuse to get a word in. Go on. So obviously we had the Jaguar engine in yeah. there, didn't we? And then in here, we had the uh, seven-speed uh, semi-automatic gearbox. Um, do not ask me what the gearbox was called, because it's been a while. However, what I do know is that it was a seven-speed forward, seven-speed backwards gearbox. So it would, and it has been done, go as fast backwards, so as fast in reverse, as it does forwards. One of the, uh, the confidence-building exercises we occasionally did uh, and it was designed to build confidence between the driver and the commander was to uh, for the for the driver either be um, either in the hull up position or hull down and you would reverse um, preferably on on flat ground and you would change up through first second third fourth fifth sixth and then pushing seventh gear At seventh gear she's really leggy and, and you're starting to get into the 40-something miles an hour, which to everybody else normally wouldn't sound so fast. But in an in a eight, nine-ton vehicle across country, that gets quite a bit twitchy. And in the tillers, because obviously it's a, it's a tiller-steered vehicle, any movement at that speed is incredibly twitchy. And so once you get into that seventh gear, the commander has to turn around, obviously, at this point, and cross his arms. So in reference to left stick or right stick, he's giving you the correct one. So he has to reverse the controls, as it were. And then he'd bring it to a halt. But it just demonstrated the speed of which this vehicle could jockey in and out of position. Because that, you know, you, the guy that trained on that, that's one of the things. You are, if you're waiting in reconnaissance, this idea that everyone thinks, you know, gun forward, you're going to be fighting whoever's coming the other way. Actually... One of the key components on this vehicle, this best weapon, is probably the radio, because you're there 
to get that info back. So the idea that if you're in a frontline position, you need to back out, bug out quickly, and that going reverse at speed is going to be, you know, that might be saving your bacon as well as the unit you're with. So uh, quite an important feature. I've David, thank you very much for taking us through um, a vehicle variant that is incredibly close to my heart. Um, and for something that... I'm going to interrupt you there, just to interrupt you. Did you like it as a vehicle? I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. And I hated it in equal measures. Right. And why is that then? Pack changes. Changing the engine or the gearbox is uh, basically you will lose all the skin on your knuckles. Yeah. Um, but for its speed, agility, and the real, the real gem about this vehicle and any armored vehicle, whether it be a Russian one, which I'm sure the Russian crews found all the challenges to that's just behind you there, is the experience with the people inside. Um, you will experience things inside an armored vehicle uh, that you won't you won't have anywhere else because it's a real team effort um, and you really do bond um, with your crew. That or you have a very, very long, awkward and uncomfortable experience if you don't get on. Um, so it's important that you do get on. But yeah, generally, I, I had some of the best times in the army um, on one of these. Everything from driver, uh, gunner and operator to commanding. Commanding was, was probably the, the highlight of my army career. I'm, I'm going to say this, I'm not on your behalf, but <laughs> the point is, the danger I can always see is, again, if you've got people watching this who love most sport and everything else, you can tell, you know, you, we've all done the top trumps, the best bit of kit in the world is utterly, utterly useless unless you've got good blokes, well-trained, who are motivated, crewing it. So that, that to me, is one of those things, that, uh, part of our story here. Yeah, the technology's here. Yes, we can all get off on one about that Jaguar engine and everything. But the truth about it is it's about the men inside it. And that, to me, is the most vital, important ingredient. It is not the kit. It is the motivation and what the blokes are actually up to inside that vehicle that is going to mean whether or not we remain a free democracy or not one day. And that's why I think that bit's so important to get across. Um, and also to get across, uh, now women in armoured vehicles. Of course. Of uh, course which, yeah. which, is, which is wonderful and mega. And... I suspect will 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 bring some um, incredibly amusing times as as another dynamic is added into armoured warfare. Um, uh, men tend to fart a lot in these vehicles, <laughs> and so uh, I'd like to think that 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 some of the ladies will will bring some um, decorum um, with them into the uh, inside of armoured vehicles. But we'll we'll see. David, thank you very much for the intro on the Scorpion, the CVRT fleet and the Jaguar engine. Um, and we'll speak to you shortly. Hi, you join us back in the Tank Museum. Uh, we've gone to a quieter area because uh, the museum uh, is alive. But that's no drama. We've got a, uh, we've got a trusty map book uh, and we're going to talk about the Rolls-Royce armoured car here and then I'll add in some nice sweeping shots later. David, thank you. Socially distanced. The Rolls-Royce armoured car, it started in 1914, didn't it? But a really long service life. So let's start from the beginning. What is it and why did Rolls-Royce make it? So uh, the whole idea behind the armoured car is, is mobility and the armoured car in the First World War is not a new idea. They, they've made some armoured cars since the beginning of the... 20th century and what the British are you know often lambasted about the First World War we all see Blackadder, Haig, all those stories as if the whole of the British army was in some you know sort of wanting to fight a 19th century war in fact before the First World War the British military had experimented with track vehicles as early as 1907 they were trialing a Hornsby tractor with tracks on to pull guns at the time um, they nowadays would probably call the technology not mature enough to put into service. Back then, it was the, they had the same issues going on. They liked the idea of a track vehicle, but they didn't think it was reliable enough yet, or that it would interface with everything else in terms of transport the army was using, which is basically horsepower. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, they did experiments with wheeled vehicles. Just before the First World War, they actually got a whole load of London buses put an armoured or an infantry unit, as it were, into them. In the London bus? In London buses <laughs> and whipped them down to the south coast with the idea that if there was an invasion, we could move large quantities of men to a specific point. Yes, they'd use the railways, but they tried this experiment with buses um, beforehand. 
And interestingly, in 1914 as well, we have a number of different schemes going on where the British Army or the British government are paying, you pay a bounty or a, a, a fee to civilian truck owners, car owners, etc. And basically the rule is, if we go to war, we give you that money, that gives us the right to then take that vehicle into service if we're going to need it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the idea that the, the somehow anti-transport or anti-motorisation or something is just rubbish. Um, it's back to the same idea would be perhaps, you know, electric drive. It's not that the military are thinking electric drive is rubbish or something, it's just that we need to be, because of the nature of when we're going to need those vehicles, is it going to be reliable, ready enough, sources of power, etc. So before they take that leap, but they're already looking at electric drive vehicles. So it, just before the First World War, and then one, one other point, I just want to, because I just think it's so relevant, especially to the audience there. So when you get in your car every day and you've got an accelerator, you've got a brake pedal, you've got your clutch pedal, they're only in the order they are now because the British government before the First World War said to all the vehicle manufacturers, we may need your vehicles in time of war, our guys are not going to have much time to get familiar with your particular model, therefore, please gentlemen, can you all put your, your pedals in the same order so we know that we're not going to suddenly press on the brake and find Is that right? Absolutely. I did not know so, that. So one of those little sort of little things that, you know, I love those tangents to everyday life sort of thing, but there you are. So every member of the public who comes here today, they'll be driving down here, parking out the front, and they little do they know, you know, but we have that as part yeah. of one of the displays. So anyway, so the idea is we go off to war, there is a war of movement in August of 1914 to Christmas, um, we send out a number of vehicles from the UK, are sent out to help the forces in France, um, and there's also a number of vehicle owners, so you're a wealthy chap, you've got a chauffeur, and you've got a Rolls Royce in the garage, you say to your chauffeur, George, do you fancy um, coming out to France with us and helping out with the lads out there? So they all kick themselves up, and they go out, and there is actually vehicles, privately owned and privately driven, lending to support to the soldiers in the field. Now, it's actually the Royal Naval Air Service that first look at the idea we could do with some vehicles that have armour plate on because they're trying to defend some forward air bases and think of this without the trenches, without the front lines having developed yet, this is still a war of movement mm. and if you've got a German patrol coming towards you, we want to send out something before it's got to our airfields and our precious planes. So the Naval Air Service puts together a unit of armoured cars, the very first ones are basically bodge ups, they go down to Dunkirk, the dockyard, they get whatever plate they've got lying around, they start putting it on the front of vehicles, the Wolseleys, there's a Rolls Royce, there's some tenders, they put improvised armour plate on these and if you look at some of the photographs of these naval um, officers, they're not just out to defend that airfield, they get dressed up and they're going to go and have some fun. And there's one photo where he's in his long Mac, he's got his cap on at rakish angle, naval beard, he's got a pistol on one side and a cutlass stuffed in his belt <laughs> the other. And you can see these are the guys that are right, where can we find some Germans to get a day? And off they head into the countryside. Now, they're starting off with pistols and rifles, the next moment they're mounting a machine gun on the front. This then gets formalised in the sense that actually the Naval Air Service goes back and says to Rolls-Royce, we're going to want some armoured cars. Unfortunately, the first official Rolls-Royce armoured cars, by the time they get to France in December of 1914, already that war of manoeuvre has broken down into a static warfare of trenches. And suddenly the wheels that we thought were really good because they got us around nice and easily, don't have a, 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 any sort of traction on a First World War battlefield. So they do have though, they make about six different armoured car units and they are they do see action in North Africa, they go into uh, some of the campaigns in colonial Africa, they see action in the Middle East, they go to Gallipoli as well, there's some that are actually landed as part of the Gallipoli landings and we perhaps have most association with T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. So that idea, so Lawrence was actually, his cottage is up the road from the tank museum, Clouds Hill. He, when he's in the desert fighting with the Arabs, he ends up saying, you know, Rolls Royces are, you know, worth rubies. They're, they're, they're the, the best thing going because it gave him speed across the desert. He could attack in places where 
the Turks on expecting him. And uh, we always associate Lawrence with rough motorbikes. But actually, after the war, one of his great lines is when he asks well, what would he best desire, he says a Rolls Royce and enough tyres and petrols to keep me going till the day I die. Um, you know, and he, he just thought the Rolls was fantastic. And, and you know, why is it fantastic? What they're doing, they're basically giving the Silver Ghost and they're armour plating it. Um, so it's a Silver Ghost chassis? Underneath there, they, they beef it up, a couple of road wheels at the back, uh, extra road wheels, stronger <coughs> brakes. Um, you're just under about four tonnes there. It's, it's uh, all of the, the, the guy, you, you know, who used to look after it for us, sadly gone now, Chester Tay used to be a regimental sergeant major in the Royal Tank Regiment. Um, he used to look after this, love taking it to when we'd go to shows and everything else. Mm. And he'd do the trick of um, saying, shall I start it? And everyone would say, oh yeah, yeah. And he said, it's already running. And then everyone went, what? And they'd go up like that and listen. And really? really? Like, yeah, it's, it's so that even then, Rolls Royce had admired Absolutely down smooth, smooth fantastically right. smooth. And that sense of the reliability, um, you, you know, and again, back to, we were talking earlier with the scorpion, you know, one of these other issues the military always has, do you go for bespoke, um, especially for you? Do you go for something off the shelf? Do you go for quality or do you go for mass? You've got a limited budget, you don't care what's going on. So this is one of those ones where they were going for the quality, but ironically, they were also going for something that was already there. They were, you know, the Silver Ghost is already out there. So this idea of building armor plate on the top, you strengthen up the frame slightly, you've got those extra road wheels on the back. Um, so it's a double wheel instead of a single one that way. And then they're putting enough armor plate on. Now armor plate at this time is to stop a bullet but not much else. Mm. So you're not going to get into conflict with anything, you know, with a larger gun or artillery or anything else that way. The armour was about 12 millimetres, wasn't it? Yeah, you're looking back in those days and, and they go through periods. Armour is not just a piece of steel. They can do something called rolled homogenous armour and you can also do something called face hardening, which makes the surface slightly more harder mm. and harder to penetrate. Um, but what they've got is with the Rolls Royce, um, the particular version we have here at the Tank Museum is actually made after the First World War, it's a 1920 pattern, which right. very similar to those, um, about 114 of them made. Um, the ones in the First World War, they, they stopped making them actually in about 1917, and that's mainly because they wanted Rolls Royce to concentrate on what they considered at the time a higher priority, which was their aeroplane engines. Right. So that, that's another one of these things where industry and military, you know, where, where can we get the best or what's the best that company mm. can actually do for the war effort. Um, 1920 pattern's got slight improvements on it, slightly different turret arrangement, still got that Vickers machine gun in the top, and normally you'd be issued uh, a three-man crew, there's a driver, commander, and gunner in the vehicle, and those lovely little radiator louvres at the front. So basically from inside the driver's cab, you can pull a lever, that opens the armoured doors at the front so that you, you can get some air to that classic Rolls-Royce radiator with still the RR on the top there. Um, you know, so everyone always goes past and then it comes back and they look, has it got the radiator? Oh look, it's still got the radiator, you know, with a lovely little RR on. True ingress and egress, how do they get in and out? So it's got tiny doors at the back just underneath the turret and the idea is you slide in so that you can then sit in the driver's position. The driver's almost sitting on the floor. Um, the gunner and the other crew member behind him have strap seats so that they, they almost suspend. They come across if you want something to sit down on. And there's little running boards and uh, stowage boxes on an area at the back, which again, depending on your, the nature of what your operation is, you can either fill full of petrol, spares, etc. Um, and you could have infantry on the back there sitting there on those two boxes. So you've got photographs with them actually carrying soldiers as well as just a three-man crew inside. Um, thank you once again. It's an absolute privilege to be able to, to sit down and talk to someone with such a wealth of knowledge about it, but also um, share it with everybody else. Um, tanks are, are designed for, for pretty much one thing, it's for dominating ground and killing things. But the, the important thing about, that I personally think about armoured vehicles is the people around them uh, and the crews that we bring. Regardless of its purpose, it's the whole from conception, design process, to the operators, and then when they go afterwards for education, I personally think that this world truly
is a, a beautiful um, surviving, surviving example. So David, thank you very much.